Uh, it is my great joy to introduce again John Kalamakitis, who we who has been so gracious as to speak at Ways of Wales and Welcome to Wales and other events of ours, and it's always a fascinating because John is sort of the Renaissance uh, mysticetologist. I just made that up. Uh, he is a a cetologist, whale and dolphin biologist, but specializes in mainly the baleen whales, which we knew very little about a few years ago, and still not much, but more because of John's work. So, John, take it away. Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, it is. Uh, I appreciate Howie, and I, I always love coming here. Uh, you guys are some of the most enthusiastic people. I think uh, uh, each of my last uh, two talks, uh, one's been focused on humpback whales and then one on gray whales. So uh, I think the theory was uh, we should move on to a different whale for today. Uh, and, and we're actually kind of moving on to my favorite whale. Uh, and this is. Uh, uh, when, I, when I first saw a blue whale in 1986, uh, I kind of fell in love with uh, these animals, so they've been my main passion. Uh, so my goal today is to talk a little bit about the status of blue whales, how they're doing in the North Pacific, uh, some of the new insights that we have into their migrations, their movements, their population structure. Uh, talk about some of the threats to whales because a lot of my research is focused uh, specifically on that. Uh, and then I want to finish uh, because we've been increasingly using some of these uh, video tags uh, to study and gain insight into both what these whales do underwater and how they react to some of these human threats to finish with showing you some of those videos. Some of these, some of these uh, a few you may have seen, but I know some of them you haven't seen because they're brand new. Uh, from some of the, the new stuff they did. Uh, this is sort of my favorite quote about blue whales from Dale Rice, written back in the 1960s. Uh, There's no whaler, which was appropriate at that time, uh, and no whale biologist, no matter how experienced, who is so jaded that his heart does not race at the sight of a blue whale. Uh, and I very much felt that way, and I still feel that way every year when I go out to, to initiate our studies on blue whales, that first encounter. It's pretty amazing, and I still vividly remember my first sighting of a blue whale in 1986. Uh, I'd never seen one before, but we were doing an aerial survey for humpback whales in the Gulf of the Farallones. It was a three-year study that uh, our primary partner that was Cascadia Research was Center for Whale Research, and Ken Balfin uh, was involved in the first three years of that humpback and blue whale study. Uh, and uh, sighting a blue whale from the aircraft, and uh, instantly you knew what it was, this kind of uh, shimmering, uh, you know, uh, blue shape under the water that you could see the whole body visible from the air, and I immediately knew that's a blue whale. We didn't expect to encounter them. Uh, we went on that year to encounter hundreds of blue whales uh, off the central and northern California coast. Uh, here was a species that, you know, uh, up to that point, we had wondered about their survival and even existence, uh, having been one of the prime targets of commercial whaling, uh, whether they were even uh, going to survive worldwide. The worldwide population of blue whales was reduced from probably 300,000 uh, down to, it's thought, maybe just a few thousand. Uh, so down to just a few percent or even less than one percent of what they had been. And the concern was were there even enough of them to recover. Uh, we were actually fortunate through our research discovered that actually the eastern North Pacific blue whale population, which historically was not a huge portion of the worldwide population, actually was currently the largest remnant population of blue whales in the world. Uh, so it actually survived whaling better than some of the other populations and has shown uh, uh, some remarkable staying power, and I'll talk a little bit about why I think that was. Uh, you know, blue whales, they're the largest animal that's ever lived. Uh, uh, you know, you see real superlatives on their size and how big and how heavy they are. Uh, our blue whales are a little bit more diminutive, so I, I don't tend to brag about their size. While you'll see in the, in the literature that blue whales get up to 110 feet, 
Uh, that was an exaggeration. The largest actually measured blue whale was 98 feet, uh, but our local blue whales are can only get up to the maximum of the mid 80s at best. But that's a pretty big whale, and uh, that, double the length of uh, you know humpback and gray whales and other species I see. Now, blue whales have been one of the three species our research has focused on, and I mentioned I've talked about humpback whales and gray whales in other years here, uh, and uh, it's a very parallel study that we do with all three of these species. We're really aimed at answering some pretty basic questions. Uh, what are their abundance? What are their movements? What's the insight into their behavior we can get from tag deployments? And throughout all of these, we've also been very much interested in what are the impacts of human activities on them. Uh, much like gray whales and humpback whales and killer whales, uh, blue whales are distinguishable, can be individually tracked by their natural markings. Uh, up at the top right there, you actually see one of our oldest individuals that uh, we've been able to track uh, for more than 35 years. Uh, over time, that may go longer. It's a whale that was uh, actually photographed prior to our study in 1975 uh, by researchers conducting a survey and having a rare blue whale sighting. Uh, and it turned out to be an individual that we kept seeing to this day. Our catalog size of these different whales, and blue whales are on the bottom here, you know, the, our intense study on blue whales began in 1986. Uh, we currently have over 2,000 individuals identified, uh, and, you know, uh, and actually this is a little out of date, we're actually over 2,500 now uh, from that number there, and we have close to 20,000 of these identification encounters where we see individual whales. Now, whales along our coast, uh, blue whales, you, you don't see them very often in the Salish Sea. Uh, and most of the historical records we have of blue whales coming into inside waters uh, did not begin or did not end well. And that includes uh, uh, several blue whales that have come in wrapped around the bow of ships uh, coming into ports. Uh, uh, going back many decades, and I'll talk about the ship strike uh, issue. Uh, and there's one kind of mystery whale thought to be a blue whale that came down into uh, uh, in historical uh, times, and there's many accounts of people chasing and shooting it and trying to kill it. So, uh, But most of the blue whales are concentrated off the U.S. West Coast. Uh, we get them here off the Washington coast. I've sighted uh, uh, blue whales on uh, only about a half dozen occasions off the Washington coast, so not very often, but we do get them. I've shown four plots here from four different of the line transect surveys that Southwest Fisheries Science Center does in different years, and each of those dots shows where they sighted blue whales. And one thing you'll notice is there's quite a bit of difference between the sightings, and I'll allude to this in a couple of other areas. For example, you'll see the 1996 sightings actually look much more numerous uh, than in any other year, uh, and especially what occurred in the 2000s. And I'll show you that that translates into some very different estimates of how many blue whales uh, are typically feeding off uh, the U.S. West Coast. But you'll, the couple of points I'll want to make is you'll see their distribution is concentrated uh, a little bit more towards Southern California um, in terms of where the main sightings are. They occur both in coastal waters and offshore waters. They actually are a little denser right at the shelf edge is their primary area of concentration. They're almost exclusively krill feeders uh, and krill abundance. Uh, tends to occur in those highly productive waters right at the shelf edge where you get uh, upwelling. Uh, we have, much like we have for gray whales and humpback whales, assigned what we call these uh, biologically important areas for blue whales. We uh, did this paper just a couple of years ago. That map and those color codes uh, show some of these uh, kind of relative densities of blue whales as they exist off the coast. And you'll see highest densities in the Southern California Bight uh, and also up off, uh, uh, you know, the Gulf of the Farallones off San Francisco, which is shown in that top right. Does that look a little blurry to you guys? Do we have any ability to adjust focus at all? That's as focus as it's going to get. Okay. It looks a little sharp. It looks sharp on my laptop. That's why. 
But anyway, well, I'll, I'll keep going, but if there's uh, any way to adjust that, that's great. Uh, you'll see that the concentration and the colors, and the colors there actually represent what's called a habitat density model uh, developed by some of the uh, Southwest Fishery Science Center scientists. Uh, and it shows how blue whale density goes offshore, but those blue colors offshore show lower density than the red and yellow colors close to shore. So they're more concentrated near shore, but occur well offshore as well, and you can see more concentrated to the south than to the north up off our coast. Uh, we did assign these biologically important areas. They ended up having a greater significance than I realized. So one, I'll be talking about the effect of sonar on whales. Uh, one of the conditions that was negotiated in the Navy with its permit uh, for where, to, where it could do uh, mid-frequency sonar activities uh, actually ended up stipulating that they could not do it in any of these designated biologically important areas for blue whales. Now, the population trends have been pretty different and, uh, between humpback whales and blue whales. And because these both humpbacks and blue whales use the same areas and overlap both in their prey, humpback whales are a little more coastal. They're able to feed on both fish or krill, blue whales more exclusively krill feeders. But still, both were hunted by whalers uh, and depleted. Uh, and on the top graph there, you see the trend for humpback whales showing a pretty steady increase that only leveled off in the last five, six, seven years. A little more puzzling picture for, hump, for blue whales, which is what you see in the lower graph. And you see three different lines there. Uh, and first of all, let's see if I can use my cursor to show you. Can, does that show up? blurry screen. Uh, these boxes here show uh, the trend in the estimates from those ship surveys that do line transect estimates. And you can see here in the 1990s, they were estimating about 2,000 blue whales along the U.S. West Coast. And then their estimates in the 2000s dropped down to 500 to 1,000. They dropped down quite a bit. And that reflected that much lower density of blue whales that was occurring off the U.S. West Coast. Now that concerned us a lot. Our estimates, which come from these identified individuals, are shown both in blue here, and these are two different mark recapture estimates. They did not, they showed more a stable population. And what we realized was that uh, what had happened between the 1990s and the 2000s appeared to be not that the blue whale population had declined, but their use of U.S. West Coast waters had declined. Uh, and, and that's, of course, uh, of some concern, but uh, all the indications that we got was that uh, when you see changes in krill abundance, you have two different species here, and they seem to react in two different ways. In that mid-2000 period, humpback whales switched from feeding on krill to primarily feeding on fish. And I'll show you a little plot I may not, actually, I might not have put it in here, but krill abundance was depressed in the mid-2000s. Uh, so humpback whales were able to use their ability to switch prey uh, to target other prey, but blue whales don't have that ability, and blue whales voted with their flukes uh, and basically moved to other areas. Uh, and the primary areas they moved to were both more intensely using waters off of uh, Baja and Mexico, areas they go to in wintertime to keep feeding in the summer and also going farther north. Uh, in one of those years, uh, we did a survey up off the Queen Charlotte Islands in BC and we ended up finding a concentration of blue whales up there and they were some of the same individuals we had identified off California. And similarly, blue whales were encountered up in the Gulf of Alaska in areas they had not been seen in recent years and those turned out to be some of our blue whales from uh, the U.S. West Coast. So we realized that blue whales were sort of, uh, were, uh, were not as tied to location as humpback whales. Uh, and being exclusive krill feeders, they moved to where the prey was better. Now pretty much the, the group of blue whales I'm going to talk about, I'm going to call the Eastern North Pacific blue whale population. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I, I'm not going to belabor all of the numbers in here other than all of these boxes show the range of these same animals and some of the studies documenting some of the interchange. But we do know from up here 
uh, in the Gulf of Alaska and especially the eastern Gulf of Alaska, it's the same blue whales that use those waters extending all the way down the U.S. West Coast, off Mexico, and down here to an area called the Costa Rica Dome, um, an area down near the equator. And what all of these areas that blue whales use have in common is that they are all highly productive areas. Um, and, uh, and one of, uh, because of this pattern, we became very interested in, okay, let's start looking at blue whales in some of these other areas like British Columbia. But we also, I've launched two expeditions to the Costa Rica Dome uh, to look at blue whales in those areas and identify them. And one of the things that uh, has come out of that that was a surprise, we were pretty used to thinking of baleen whales because we think of gray whales or humpback whales as kind of seasonal feeders, that they feed in spring, summer, fall, and then they go to these winter areas and fast for three or four months. Areas like Hawaii that humpback whales go to or the coastal Central America and Mexico areas that uh, uh, humpbacks go to heavily from the U.S. West Coast or the breeding lagoons that gray whales go to. Those are not heavy feeding areas and, and those whales are largely fasting during that period. But blue whales, it turns out, feed year-round. Uh, so we realized that even though they shift their location seasonally in winter, they're still feeding. And for example, you know, one of the first things we did when we got down to the Costa Rica Dome, this is, uh, we deployed some of these suction cup tags I, I'm going to talk about. And this is the dive record of a blue whale here that you see going down. And these series of upward movements here, those are actually the blue whale making these lunges. And then I overlay that with where the krill was. And you can see there was a krill patch right there where that animal was going down. This was one of the first animals we tagged on the Costa Rica Dome. And right away we're saying, okay, there's krill here. The blue whales are feeding. And that was in the dead of winter in January. Um, so it, it very much revealed that uh, uh, blue whales feed year-round. And some of these you know, more warm water tropical areas that they go to because they do shift south in winter are highly productive areas. So the main three areas that blue whales go to in winter uh, are the Costa Rica Dome. Uh, they also go into the Sea of Cortez or the Gulf of California. And they also concentrate off the southwest coast of Baja, all areas where there's productivity in winter. Uh, and then they shift to these higher latitude areas in spring, summer, and fall. Though it's not any kind of a regimented migration like, say, the gray whales do. They're really constantly moving around looking for food. And there are actually some blue whales that stay on the Costa Rica Dome year-round. So if they're finding good prey, they might stay in an area and not go through these very set movements. I've grabbed just a couple of slides from a recent presentation that uh, Andy Douglas at Cascadia did that also showed that uh, while we don't think it's common, uh, we actually found some matches that show cross-equatorial uh, movements of some of these blue whales. So the Costa Rica Dome is an area just north of the equator. Uh, the Galapagos is just south of the equator, and we actually have a match of a blue whale going between those areas. Uh, so while we think most blue whales from the southern hemisphere, which would typically uh, come up and be uh, in their kind of northern waters, their warm water areas in what would be our summer, southern hemisphere winter. Uh, we did have one whale that seemed to just be going between those two areas. <clears throat> and, and this is the movement, you see it's not that far apart between, you can see Galapagos just south of the equator, the Costa Rica Dome just north of the equator. Uh, but it was interesting that we had this uh, movement of animals Here's the particular individual that was involved with that. So it doesn't dramatically change our picture still. Blue whale occurrence, it's concentrated kind of in the northern off the U.S. west coast up to the Gulf of Alaska, uh, and it goes all the way down to that uh, uh, Costa Rica Dome area. And you can see we put another blue whale there just south of there at the Galapagos, occasionally wandering into uh, you know, south of the equator. And that's the range of our eastern North Pacific blue whales. They, uh, they're, uh, you know, the worldwide kind of genetic studies, population studies haven't fully identified how, uh, you know, all the different kind of distinct units of blue whales or populations of blue whales that exist, but it looks like there's about 11 of them. One of the more interesting ways to look at that is they all have distinct calls. So the call 
uh, how each of them produces calls and typically produces two to three types of calls. Uh, in almost all populations, there is a very loud uh, kind of broadcast call that at least in the Eastern North Pacific call, it has two forms, we call them A and B calls. And um, those are produced almost solely by males. Uh, and then there's another type of call that seems to be produced sometimes by females as well that's more variable, not as loud, it's a little bit higher frequency. But what each of those call patterns look like, whereas the feeding call can look a little bit alike, especially that winter breeding call that the males make is what's very distinct from population to population. Now initially we didn't think uh, only male blue whales called and we didn't think it was a reproductive or a mating related call because you can hear it year round. <clears throat> But just like blue whales don't seem to have a dedicated breeding area where they go and they just breed and they don't feed, it looks like some of their mating activities extend year-round. So you can hear that call almost year-round, but what we've seen in some of our studies is that the frequency that they're producing that call increases as you approach the breeding season, uh, you know, and then peaks during the breeding season and then does this precipitous drop. So it is still on a cycle, though not as pronounced as we might see in for example, humpback whale song uh, that is more uh, strongly seasonal uh, than it is for blue whales. Okay, just showing some of the movements of northern and some of southern hemisphere whales. That's the one animal moving between those regions. Okay, uh, I don't think I'll belabor this. This is just some of the matches between regions just making the point I've just made for you. Uh, oh, look, I did include my figure. So this is a... Uh, uh, Coming back to a previous point, I mentioned about krill abundance, and I just want to show you, this is actually humpback whale data, but it makes this point I was trying to make about krill. Uh, over here, these bars. <clears throat> uh, this goes from uh, the 1990s up to 2012 to the right. And these different bars, for example, these bars here are the stable isotope uh, of nitrogen and carbon as we found in the skin of humpback whales. And you'll see that they make this shift in the mid 2000s, right here, this area here, uh, suggesting that humpback whales were feeding on something different in that time period. And this bar here shows the anchovy abundance. You see it increased during that mid 2000s period. And here's a bar showing the krill abundance. It declined during that period. So this was kind of the demonstration that humpback whales were switching prey from krill to fish in the mid-2000s, exactly that time period that blue whales became more scarce in this same region that the humpbacks were using. And it also matched where we started to see blue whales up here in the Prince William Sound, you know, and not in Prince William Sound, but in the Gulf of Alaska outside of it, and in the Queen Charlottes. Uh, it looked to us like some of this was tied to oceanographic regime shifts. Uh, you know, we're always very watchful and concerned about the impacts of climate change, and I think it's one of the biggest long-term threats to blue whales. In this particular case, it, it looked like our shift in the mid-2000s did seem to parallel some of these cyclical decadal oscillations in ocean conditions. And in particular, something called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, the PDO, has gone through different phases. And it was sort of interesting when we looked at the PDO regime shifts, uh, you know, and, and they're referred to as cold and warm regime. And this is now going back to the early 1900s. And here you see what, what I've pulled out is the whaling data of when did whalers kill blue whales in different areas. And what you'll see is that uh, whalers heavily killed blue whales in this cold water PDA shift up uh, in areas like BC and further north. Uh, and during the warm regime, this is when the hunting was heaviest in Mexico and more southern waters. So we actually think we saw a little bit of the shift like we saw between the 1990s and 2000, actually seemed to parallel what occurred historically in terms of where whalers killed whales. Uh, now, I've been talking about the fact there are at least 11 blue whale populations. There is at least one other population in the uh, uh, North Pacific, uh, and there may be several more of them. We primarily study these eastern animals, and these X's on this map 
shows all the locations that whalers killed blue whales. Uh, and these are some possible boundaries. You know, we have our Eastern North Pacific group here, but whalers killed a lot of whales over in the Western Pacific and Central Pacific. And those all seem to be mostly of a different population that does not seem to have recovered as well. We are, we are not finding evidence of large numbers of blue whales where whalers killed many of those blue whales more in the Central and Western Pacific. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there's uh, some other data, and I'm going to talk in detail about tagging and some of the different types of tagging. Just while I'm talking about the range of movements of blue whales, uh, Bruce Mate and Oregon State University has tagged now over 200 blue whales with uh, what are called these deep implant satellite tags. And I'll show you some of our concerns about those. Uh, uh, we have some concerns about them, but this is some of the data uh, as published in a paper in late 2000 that showed some of the satellite tag movements of blue whales. And you'll actually see that it kind of matches what I was describing, areas of concentration uh, off of uh, kind of uh, the U.S. West Coast, but mostly concentrated off Southern California. Occasional movements up into the Gulf of Alaska and then that movement, the very southern end of that movement, is down to the uh, Costa Rica Dome area. Uh, uh, I, I won't make this point. So let me talk a little bit about tagging and tag types uh, and what we... Oh, wow. Time flies when you're... <laughs> uh, I'll probably have to move a little faster. Um, you know, I'm going to talk about tag results, but it's really important to realize there are many different types of tags and there are many different ways to attach tags. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've primarily done the first one on this list, which is short-term suction cup, uh, are what are called archival tags, tags that you have to recover and record data on board. Uh, the trade-off is you get highly detailed data for short periods with the least invasiveness at the top of this list. And then as you go down to the bottom, the deep implant position only tags are really what you tend to get the longest deployments, but uh, we have not used those types of tags, but we've been studying some of the longer term effects of those types of tags. But that migration pattern data came from those types of tags because they can stay on for typically on average three, four months, and sometimes as long as a year. Uh, you end up getting very limited data, sometimes it's just position data, uh, once a day, but you get it over a longer period. So as I talk, you'll see I'll be talking about some of the different ways, and again, they have different implications for the type of data you get and the level of invasiveness of these different types of tags. Uh, we recently did complete a study on uh, kind of the long-term impact of these implant tags. So of the, uh, uh, I mentioned over 200 animals that OSU and Bruce Mate have satellite tagged, we were able to get identifications of, of just a little, almost half of them, so we could track the fate of those animals. Uh, and we did sometimes see pretty extensive injuries, like these are uh, large swellings that occurred in two different individuals. It looks like that was from an early version of these satellite tags where uh, uh, one of the anchors broke off and stayed embedded in the whale and it caused this larger long-term swelling. Um, we just published uh, uh, this past year in Marine Mammal Science the results of, uh, of this follow-up study. It's uh, Stephanie Norman, who many of you know and works with uh, Orca Network, is the senior author. She collaborated with us in evaluating uh, these photos. So that just came out in Marine Mammal Science. Uh, there was also an earlier publication that uh, uh, I was involved with, done by Diane Gendron, that focused on one of those individuals with that large swelling, and actually showed what the table shows, I won't go through it, is that it looks like for the extended period that animal had that large swelling, it actually impeded its reproduction. Uh, so it was uh, seen with calves in years uh, before it was tagged, it was not seen with a calf in all the years where that swelling existed. Once it seemed to be able to uh, 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 extrude that prong that was embedded in it, the swelling went down and then it returned to having calves. But it does look like uh, for a period of time it likely had an effect on reproduction. 
so the main tags that I'm going to talk about, though, are these uh, suction cup attached tags. These are the archival tags. Uh, we've also, to a limited degree, been using uh, darts to get longer term attachments, as in a week or two. Uh, the tag is still external, but we uh, try to get a longer attachment with suction cups. We've also been trying to get suction cups that stay on longer. We actually had a record over 100 hour deployment with uh, a suction cup attached tag that as far as I know is the longest uh, anyone has managed to have a suction cup tag stay on a, uh, on any whale. We started initially with these critter cams that were big and bulky. Uh, these are titanium housed uh, uh, video cameras with limited sensor data, a large suction cup that you have to use, use act active suction to suck down. Uh, then we went smaller. What I'm going to show you some of the video from is from the one at the bottom there <coughs> that is uh, a new tag that we've collaboratively, co collaboratively developed with uh, uh, a group called Customized Animal Tracking Solutions in Australia. Uh, and it's being used uh, Stanford, Jeremy Goldbogen at Stanford, Ari Freelander is now at UC Santa Cruz, uh, and Cascadia have helped try to design uh, this tag. It has video cameras, sometimes dual video cameras, and I'll show you results of some new tags using actually a 360 degree camera. But they also have these high resolution sensors that can record things like three dimensional accelerometry and magnetometry hundreds of times a second. So you get very detailed data on that. If you've seen my talks on uh, gray whales, those are the types of tags we deployed on. Uh, our sounders, gray whales. Okay, uh, you know, we attach these tags with a pole approaching a whale. This was <coughs> a photograph off Southern California uh, of us approaching a blue whale to deploy a tag. You can see we have the tag on the end of a pole there uh, and uh, attaching it. Uh, we probably had now, I want to say, close to 20 publications. <coughs> uh, on the uh, results of some of these tag deployments. Initially, they focused on uh, kind of insights into how they feed, how deep they feed, how they approach prey, interactions with prey. Uh, and now, more recently, they're kind of the heart of how we can study the more subtle behavioral impacts of things like maybe sonar, or how animals react or interact with ships when they become vulnerable to ship strikes. And there are a number of these threats. These are the main threats that we've been uh, kind of concerned uh, with, disturbance, ship strikes, entanglements. Uh, the first one we intensely studied was uh, ship strikes. This was uh, the result of the fact that in the fall of 2007, so by this time I've been studying blue whales for about 20 years, um, we had at least four and possibly five blue whales uh, that had been struck and killed by ships wash up just in the fall of 2007, just in Southern California. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, that sounds like a lot, but what I knew is that the vast majority of blue whales that die are never recovered or documented. In fact, our indications are that it might be 5% or less of blue whales that die are actually documented. Uh, our tag data show why that is. These animals are primarily negatively buoyant. Uh, so they'll typically sink, and if the water is deep enough in blue whales with where they're feeding, it typically is. Even when they try to bloat, that pressure would keep them uh, from surfacing because they would not be able to expand or bloat. Uh, there are animals that would stay at the surface, and then they bloat, and they float really high, and it looks like, oh, there's no problem with that. But the majority of them are sinking, and then the pressure keeps them from refloating. So we were worried that really if you wanted an accurate assessment of that event in the fall of 2007, you might need to multiply the observed number of ship strikes by 20 uh, to get what might be a better estimate uh, of the correct number. Now it's hard to make a strong case for that, so currently uh, we have a paper that just came out that makes another case for how you know, even though we document these ship strikes, it represents just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the impact uh, of ships on these whales. And partly that's because there are several key areas 
I mentioned the high density of blue whales in the Southern California Bight. Well, some of the heaviest areas they use are areas that the shipping lanes coming and going from Los Angeles Long Beach Harbor transit through. So you have this overlap of the busiest, I think second biggest, second busiest port in the world, certainly one of the busiest in, uh, in the Eastern North Pacific. Uh, and the ships coming and going from that port uh, travel right through some of the prime blue whale feeding grounds. And then the other area I pointed out, the Gulf of the Farallones, well that's where San Francisco Bay and all shipping traffic coming into uh, uh, Richmond and San Francisco and Oakland all come through some of those same waters. And I'll show you some of the implications of that. Uh, you know, we're part of the Stranding Network as is, uh, you know, a number of other groups. Uh, what we've seen is uh, this shows the proportion of whales that show evidence of having been struck by ships by decades, so going back to the 1970s. And you'll see the last two bars to the right show a dramatic increase uh, in the proportion of animals that we find in, in terms of whales uh, that show evidence of ship strike. So it's fully a third of animals. And for some species like fin whales and blue whales, that percent is even higher. Uh, and so partly this is a result of increased shipping traffic, faster ships, and bigger ships. I think all of those pose increased threats uh, to blue whales. Okay, I'm gonna stop and take stock. I'm almost at noon uh, here. I think we started just a few minutes late. When do you need me to stop by, Howie? Uh, supposed to be over at Smart Lunch at noon. Is that 12, Okay. Okay, 20 minutes. So I'm going to go through a, a little bit. Uh, I'll go, go through some slides quickly because I really want to get to some of the video. Um, <clears throat> we've been studying how whales interact with ships uh, by deploying these tags. We discovered that blue whales spend are most vulnerable to ship strikes at night. That's when they spend most of their time at the surface. They spend twice as much time in the water column area where they would be vulnerable to ship strike at night than they do in the day. And that top graph just shows you a 24-hour period in the dive record of a blue whale. And that uh, left period there, it's supposed to be shaded, but I don't know if you can see, but uh, uh, that, the, that entire period where it's diving shallow is nighttime and then it resumes deep diving in the day. Uh, and you can see that, like, I can look at that. This is more like a 13-day period in the dive record of a blue whale. And you can count the days uh, and nights. So each of these, there's one day, two day, three day, four day, and these are the nighttime periods in between. So you can see while there's some variation in how deep they're diving and what they're feeding on, you see this very clear day night difference in diving behavior. So that right away told us if we're gonna solve the ship strike issue, putting observers on ships to spot whales or something like that, that's not gonna be very effective. And we really need to think hard about where ships are at night. It also just made me realize so many of our studies of whales prior to these tags was based on what we could study in the daytime. And you know, I, I always thought that these tags were opening up the underwater world of blue whales to us, but they were also opening up the nighttime world of blue whales because they do very different things at night. They're largely not feeding, they're resting at the surface. And it's kind of uh, a puzzle to scientists because the krill tends to come closer to the surface at night. So you'd think it would be more accessible to blue whales and they ought to be feeding more at night. But for a blue whale, what we've discovered is these lunges and how they feed engulfing their prey, and I'll show you a few, you know, uh, um, some video of that, is ener really energetically costly. And for a blue whale, it's all about how much krill can I capture in a mouthful. When krill density is high, that's one of the most efficient feeding mechanisms documented in any animal species. Uh, but if krill density is low, it can actually take more energy than they're getting from the krill. So that's why it's all about how dense is the krill. And if they have to dive deep to get to denser patches of krill, that's worthwhile. If the krill are near the surface, but they're more scattered, then that might not make feeding worthwhile. Okay, I promise to go faster. This is a paper that just came out last year. Uh, it's available on our website. Uh, we, we've linked uh, distribution model of blue whales with all of the ship traffic in the entire west coast area 
a guy named Cotton Rockwood at Point Blue helped develop this and we were able to use this to identify all the key areas where we needed to be most concerned about ship strikes. And it showed that it wasn't just in the shipping lanes. There were many ships that transit the coast and travel pretty close to that shelf edge where blue whales are most abundant and most productive. And so you see some of these red streaks like right here. These are outside of shipping lanes. So while our initial focus had been how can we move shipping lanes, we realized we also need to pay attention to these transit routes of ships outside of shipping lanes. Okay, I think I moved over a slide there. <coughs> that study also showed that the level of deaths of blue whales that you would predict, even if you assume that they try to avoid ships to some degree, uh, is more along the lines that we were projecting if only a small fraction of the whales were being discovered that were hit by ships. And they uh, certainly exceed what we call, you know, the allowable limit for human impact, something called PBR, that's kind of mandated to be uh, the precautionary number is primarily used for fishery entanglement and takes with marine mammals, but ship strikes alone, it looks like, exceed it for blue whales. We showed that blue whales were uh, very vulnerable to ships because they seemed to not take evasive action. Uh, even though we documented many of these kind of close calls and all of these plots are actually cases where we're plotting the movement of a ship and a movement of a whale with these tags and with visual observation, and even when a blue whale was crossing the path of a ship and an imminent risk of being hit by a ship, it took very little evasive action uh, and, and no detectable change in course. Now, we did have a unique case uh, here where we actually were tracking a blue whale. It actually had two of our suction cup tags on it, two types of tags. Uh, and as we tracked it, we had a ship come through it, and I could tell this ship was right on a collision course with this blue whale. And as the blue whale came to the surface right here, uh, right in the path of the ship, it reversed and dove deep. So that was uh, a little bit of a sign that while they don't change course, they do know to abort their surfacing uh, if there's an imminent risk of a ship. Uh, so this was, gave us that they have at least some ability to react. Uh, we're actually working on a publication on this uh, particular case because it kind of shows us it was our uh, our estimates aren't super precise because the accuracy of our ability to know, but it looks like this was in the tens of meters uh, between the ship and the whale before the whale took this uh, evasive action. Uh, just to show, you know, what one whale can face, uh, we did one of these medium duration attachments where we used darts to get a longer deployment of one of these archival tags. And this was off San Francisco, and this shows the track of the whale and in relation to the shipping lanes uh, in this figure on the left. And you'll see this whale spent extensive periods of time right in the shipping lanes. And with the uh, acoustics on the tag, we documented 14 of these near misses uh, just uh, in this uh, uh, period uh, of about 10 days uh, of this one whale. So it all kind of drove home that point. I'm not gonna uh, we've been using the, the same technique in multiple areas. We've also been using it to look at how whales change behavior in relation to things like Navy sonar. And I'm going to, again, jump over some slides here. To uh, Let me make one point with this slide. We have achieved some <clears throat> uh, kind of valuable changes. Uh, both the, the uh, shipping lanes off San Francisco and those off Southern California were shifted slightly. Uh, with whale distribution being the motivation to try to separate these tracks that, that ships take from the main areas of whale concentration. But in both areas, the latitude we had to recommend or make changes were pretty small. In Southern California, it was heavily restricted by the best course would be for ships to not come through the Santa Barbara Channel. But for ships to avoid that, they would be traveling through a Navy training area that's south of the island and the Navy strenuously objected. They even objected to trying to put a speed limit in the Santa Barbara Channel because they worried that would promote ships to take this alternate route on their own. Uh, so we, we've kind of run into that and it kind of has sabotaged an ability to make larger changes, though a small shift was able to be made. I think in both of those cases, it probably reduced risk 
you know, in the tens of percent, but not a dramatic change. Uh, we've been using these tags to study sonar, how uh, uh, whales and not just uh, blue whales, but other species of whales respond to mid-frequency sonar. I'll just cut ahead and just say, um, you know, what we've shown, we published a couple of papers about the fact that <clears throat> we were able to document that blue whales, are, even though mid-frequency sonar is at a much higher frequency than what we would typically think blue whales would respond to, uh, we did show blue whales responded, uh, often stopping to feed and avoid uh, areas, uh, their feeding area when they did hear the sonar. Uh, and it's, they seemed particularly susceptible when they were in that deep feeding mode. Okay, let's say that we're gonna. Uh, okay, I already mentioned that. Uh, interestingly, entanglements have, which have dramatically increased for humpback whales on the west coast. In the last year or two, for the first time we're seeing, uh, we had I think three blue whales reported entangled um, in fishing gear last year. So it also seems like there's some risk there that we're kind of a little puzzled by. Why humpbacks are more exposed makes sense because humpback populations have been increasing and they've been expanding into areas that overlap with the fishery, but we're puzzled why we're seeing more of these entanglements in blue whales. Uh, most recently, we've been doing a study uh, combining uh, aerial drone use, uh, monitoring of uh, whales, and this is us deploying a tag. These are both those photographs taken from uh, drones that were operated by Duke. This is part of a collaborative NSF-funded study that we're doing with Stanford, Duke, uh, St. Louis University, and Westchester University, looking at uh, how different species fin, uh, swim and how the kinematics and maneuverability of whales changes with size. It's a little bit more of an academic oriented study. So here are my main just conclusions that we see uh, that Eastern North Pacific blue whales are doing pretty well, uh, especially in relation to how blue whales have been doing worldwide. Uh, but we have at least three major threats of concern right now uh, and the looming change that would pose by things like climate change, blue whales being a very specialized feeder, uh, is looming out there. Uh, okay, and now let me, I've got a few minutes to show a few videos, it sounds like. Okay. Uh, yeah, I know. It's the best part, but I always go to, don't leave enough time for it, so. Uh, I'll just, uh, we'll, we'll queue up a few videos here and show you just a few things. Uh, while I'm queuing this up, since I want to, this might just take a second, uh, any questions? Yes? When they travel, do they ever really book it and travel faster for long periods of time? Uh, you know, fast, yes. You know, um, you know, blue whales are capable of speeds. We've clocked them at up to 15 knots, but typically they kind of lope along at, you know, about three to five knots is the, is a speed, typical speed of a blue whale, but they can maintain that 24 hours a day. So. Uh, covering over 100 nautical miles a day is, when a, is typical for when a blue whale is kind of moving at that consistent five knot speed for 24 hours. Then they're going to cover, and that, and you cover a lot of ground pretty quick by doing that. So they may not be speedy, but they uh, maintain that for long periods. And I think that range of movement you see, they're highly mobile in, uh, in, in their movements. Yeah, I'm just curious, <clears throat> do I understand you correctly, they're going to 200 feet to get the krill? Well, the, uh, interestingly, I didn't show a, a maximum depth we've documented so far uh, is actually just over 1,000 feet, oh, wow. which is a bit of a record. Typically, they're feeding, uh, you know, and all of the, uh, if, you, if you were quick enough, since I went over them quickly, to look at the depth bars, uh, those were all in meters. So a typical blue whale is feeding at 150 to 200 meters, which translates to 500 to you know, six, 600 feet, but then we've seen them down to over 1,000 feet. Okay, uh, let's show, uh, uh, you know, I'll just show one video of deploying a tag on a blue whale and, and what that looks like. Uh, you know, uh, in this case, we're taking advantage of some uh, surface lunge feeding blue whales that uh, when they engulf prey, <clears throat> they have, you know, they more than double their uh, total body volume uh, engulfing prey and stretching out their uh, throat cleats, and that makes them not very uh, uh, mobile. Uh, so it 
kind of when they when they are feeding at the surface, it makes it fairly easy to approach them. And, uh, this is a, an approach and a deployment in a very kind of easy route where uh, a blue whale is feeding near the surface, and we kind of take advantage of it, if you will. Oh, we're getting a little bit of jerkiness in the video, but. So you don't have to use a bow at all? Or... No, pretty much, you know, uh, there are a few people that try to launch uh, tags with a bow from a distance, uh, but what we found is that it's, uh, we're able to approach and with using the pole you can get a much more controlled, you know, both placement on the whale. Well, I'm a little disappointed because I'm not sure our videos are going to do quite do this, do what I want. Uh, let me just try one quick change in setting here. I hope this doesn't throw you guys off. I'm going to go to this duplicate screen and see if that helps at all. Yes, let's try that. That's a good idea. Good a good suggestion. And uh, anything. So this is that same deployment that you didn't get to see very well here. Uh, and uh, but this is an underwater view. <laughs> Unfortunately, our videos are just uh, glitching, but here you see that in expanded throat pleats on the blue whale there. Uh, the tag is on the forward part of the animal, uh, and so this is a blue whale. We just deployed the tag on and isn't able to move very effectively. I'll keep trying this, and maybe this will improve with some of the other videos here as we go along. Let's try this one. Uh, <clears throat> One of the beauties of these tags is we're able to reconstruct all of the movements of the whale underwater. So even though this fake whale here is, looks like a humpback whale, this is blue whale data. And this ribbon is the underwater track of the blue whale reconstructed from these three-dimensional accelerometers and magnetometers. And you can even put that whole movement in motion uh, and see what the whale is swimming like. And in this case, it's going to be uh, speed it up tenfold. Uh, that bar that you see with the little tick marks on it here, that shows you how deep the whale is. This represents the surface of the water. And so you can see how deep it is. It's reconstructing the rolls. Unfortunately, on this video, it's not accurately reconstructing the speed of the animal. So right there, it made a lunge. And the video, uh, the, this particular data stream doesn't capture that when it lunges, it actually brings the whale to a standstill. Uh, but you can basically see this is the whale accelerating here. That's up into another lunge right at the surface. And anyway, this, these tags let us kind of fully reconstruct that kind of motion and movement by the whale. And that can be particularly valuable. For example, this is the same kind of data stream, or, except in this case, um, just make sure this is the one I think it is. I apologize that those aren't working uh, very well. Uh, let me just try one other thing. So this, for example, is uh, if any of you have seen the Oceans film that came out a number of years ago, uh, we, did, we worked with uh, filmmakers to get some of the underwater footage of blue whales, and that's what this is from. But here again, you see a blue whale that's just engulfed prey at the surface. And you can see that guppy-like shape from uh, and you'll actually see as this animal swims along, it's actively filtering. You'll see the shape of that whole expanded area changing as it's pushing the water out through its baleen. It's actually coming out the side of its mouth and filtering uh, that prey. Uh, you know, it takes it about 30 seconds or so before it's ready to accelerate again into 
another one of these lunges. So some of these are, are showing okay and others are not. I'll show just one. One more that shows that, you know, here's a blue whale again that's engulfed prey with that distended throat area there. And you can see the mouth is partly open and that's what water is coming out of as it uh, filters that prey out. show just a, a few more. I'm going to show you one, uh, one set of video. Uh, uh, I actually chose a humpback one to show you what uh, the kind of footage you get from some of these uh, virtual reality 360 degree video tags. And this is from a group of humpback whales off of uh, Moss Landing just this year. And it's a little disorienting. The right way to look at this is with some 360 degree visor or in a surround. Thing, so it'll be a little bit distorted, but you'll get the idea. Uh, so here we are, this is, uh, uh, oh, this one's gonna be a little jerky too, maybe, unfortunately. I'm sorry about that. Uh, what, we're, what we're seeing here is we're seeing a 360 degree view with the front being to the right, the back is in the middle, and then it comes around to the front. And um, basically what you're seeing is this is, uh, let me try to restart that again, these are, uh, a group of humpback whales and, and sea lions in this 360 degree view. Let me just see if I can throw that one more time. Yeah. yeah unfortunately, this is just a little glitchy, so maybe I, I'm going to have to not show as much of my video. I'm not quite sure why it's not running, but uh, take a, it's probably a good thing since we're, I have only two or three more minutes before 1220, if I can take just maybe a couple more questions. Yes, there, there is sound, and that's on another video that I'm not sure will show up, that, uh, uh, that, that uh, we got some recordings of blue whales calling, but it doesn't seem like we're getting, let me just see if I can get that. Oh, uh, there, we, we do have some sound. <laughs> that's good. So let me see if I, it, how, how good is the bass on this? Do we have? Let's find out, okay. Uh, so, let's see if we can hear a blue bell. Listen for a thumping sound. So that's, that's uh, you're hearing one of the loudest calls made by any animal on Earth. That's a blue whale A call. Pulsive. Uh, and what we're actually hearing is actually the upper harmonics. We're not even hearing the fundamental frequency of that call. So that's that powerful call. This is one of the tags we were able to put on a calling blue whale that actually showed it was a blue whale trailing another blue whale that's actually in the, in the, in the, in the vision there. And it actually hovers. It turns out we used to think maybe blue whales would try to dive deep to produce these calls because they would travel farther. But I think because of how it compresses air spaces, they pretty much produce the calls in about 10 to 20 meters of water. Uh, and usually they hover at that distance, uh, at that depth, produce this call, and then it accelerates after its other whale. Yes? What about the heart sound? The heart sound? You know, uh, we, we've, we've uh, uh, tried a couple of iterations. We haven't found a reliable way to get it yet, but we're looking at a way uh, to record. Uh, you know, there, there are some, uh, some tags that have been deployed on pinnipeds and some other species that we're able to monitor heart. You know, for us, we got to get through the blubber layer, and it's a, a little bit more of a challenge. Uh, and, and there are some efforts underway to do that, but currently we don't have it. It, it would be an important way to look at kind of stress response. Uh, one of the studies we're doing is with Southwest Fisheries Science Center and looking at stress hormones and how uh, things like exposure to sonar or being, being spending time in these shipping lanes changes the stress levels in some of the whales. But heart, if we can get to heart, it would be great. We're not quite there yet. Are invasive tags being reduced in use? Are invasive tags being reduced in use? Uh, the answer is no. Um, there was a workshop held last year that heavily focused on it and really what occurred around here with L95 uh, and the limpet tag 
uh, was kind of a watershed moment for uh, realizing that was one of these limpet style satellite tags. So it was a, a tag design that actually was developed to be less invasive than the implant tags, and yet, you know, it played a role in the death of, of L95, and it really kind of raised, uh, I think, the broader awareness. It's something we've been very concerned about with the implant tags. So, uh, uh, unfortunately, it looks like uh, greater efforts to improve the tags, make them less invasive, but unfortunately, I think the advent of technology and the, the uh, has not reduced their use. Um, so, yes. Has there been any consideration of trying to put a beacon in a tag that would alert a ship to a whale's location? Yes, would need so many of them and have to deploy so many of them to be yeah. effective, unfortunately. But, you know, we've thought about that and, uh, you know, there are efforts to, you know, acoustic detection methods. Can we detect when whales are in the area? It's something that was used with right whales. Unfortunately, we found that that call I played for you, uh, <clears throat> the loudest and most detectable call blue whales produce, they don't seem to produce when they're feeding. So some of these concentrations, you don't hear that much vocal activity. Uh, and so you can kind of get fooled by the acoustic detections. But there are a number of efforts to try to find ways to do it. Uh, and, and there may be some technological solutions. Right now, what we know is if we can separate whales and ships spatially, and if we can slow ships down, we know those two things work. So that's been kind of our push, but you know, hopefully finding some technology that can help in the future. Yes? Well, currently not because uh, there isn't, you know, there aren't these speed restrictions, uh, you know, that are being enforced for whales. Uh, one effort in Southern California has been to create an incentive program where ships are actually rewarded. And that follows on a program that the, uh, the port of LA Long Beach has done to reduce air pollution control. They reduce the dock fees of ships that slow down uh, within a certain radius of their port, but unfortunately doesn't extend far enough out. So that incentive program was developed to almost extend that program further out into the whale areas. And the sh shippers were really excited about doing that. It's just how do you feel about having to pay shippers to slow down? And is that the most, you know, the best solution or is it just, you know, requiring that that occurs, which would be a lot cheaper to do, of course. Yes? One more, okay. And I'll be around uh, at lunch to happy to talk to you guys. Is there anything that would make a blue oil change the things in that? In other words, you put something on a ship that would send out something that would keep oil away Yes, and, and, and it's been a, a great idea that we've tried to explore. Uh, and in particular, it was explored with uh, uh, North Atlantic right whales. Uh, Doug Nowacek did a study uh, almost 10 years ago. Uh, where he tried playing different sounds to right whales and other species very vulnerable to ship strikes. But what he kept finding is that the sounds that the whales would react to, they would typically react by coming to the surface, uh, which is not what you want. So it, often the whales aren't doing what we want, but they're, you know, uh, it is something we, uh, you know, maybe there's some unique combination. You would worry about trying to balance because we worry a lot. One of the big impacts we worry about is the effect of sound and the huge amount of sound we're putting into the ocean, whether it's the sonar or the huge contribution of ship noise, and you hate to expand that more and what impacts that would have the ship will. Uh, so you'd need a pretty big benefit in the reduction of ship strikes uh, to make that worthwhile. Okay.